One of the things I really love about the narrative lectionary, <clears throat> excuse me, is that we can follow along with stories and kind of the order in which the gospel writer, writer told them. The last few weeks we've been with Jesus and his disciples in Jerusalem. Kayla has talked about some of those stories. There's Jesus causing a huge ruckus in the temple. You remember that? And then there's Jesus having a late night, late night conversation with an elite wealthy Pharisee. And all the while, he and his disciples have been preaching and baptizing people in Jerusalem. But now as chapter four opens, Jesus knows that the Jerusalem authorities are getting, you know, sort of restless, hostile. So he and his disciples decide to head home to Galilee. Now to go north to Galilee, <clears throat> you have to walk through Samaria, which for some Jews was fraught. Samaria was not a separate country, understand that. It was just a different region. And I should add that it had one of the richest histories in Jewish history. It is, this is the territory that Abraham had first claimed as the promised land. And today's scene takes place at a well said to have been dug by Jacob himself. Samaria had once been home to 10 of the tribes of Israel. And after King Solomon, it became the separate Northern Kingdom. Now the Northern Kingdom had been notorious for its, for its tolerance of other gods. You might remember some sermons about Elijah and Micah and, Am, and Hosea and, and um, Amos yelling at them constantly about this. Nonetheless, they tolerated it. And then disaster struck. Three, just like Elijah said it would. The Northern Kingdom had been, the, the Northern Kingdom was conquered by the Assyrians and they destroyed it. You've no doubt heard of the 10 lost tribes. Many of the kingdom's people had been carried off to live in other Assyrian territories, all separated up. <clears throat> and then the Assyrians had imported other conquered people to live side by side with the remaining Jews so that the area became ethnically diverse, I think we would say. <clears throat> Excuse me. I have to tell you, that's a very clever tactic. People who do not share a history tend to be less rebellious. That's why the Assyrians did it. And so this territory now called Samaria, there were still many Jews who worshiped the God of Israel, but the Judean and Galilean Jews saw the Samarians as kind of half-breeds at best and believed that they worshiped incorrectly and probably had thrown some false gods in there as well. This is the point. Devout Jews looked down on the Samaritans. Actually, that's too mild. They despised them. You will not be surprised to hear that this troubled Jesus not at all. Jesus and his disciples on their way home came to Sychar, and while the disciples go into the village to buy food, Jesus waits by the town well, Jacob's famous well. And as you heard, a woman carrying a large jar comes to draw water from the well. And this conversation, my friends, is so astonishing that I think it bears a closer look. The conversation actually begins with a shocking request, that it begins at all as shocking. Jesus asks for a cup of water. Well, he doesn't ask. He actually commands her to give him a drink, to which we should all say, what? Jewish men do not speak to women they don't know. And frankly, she certainly had not intended to give him more than a polite nod, if that. But his command is so cheeky. So she says, she's cheeky right back. How is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink of me, a woman of Samaria? Jesus hasn't really come to talk about a cup of water. You know, he says, 
If you would just ask, I could give you living water. Well, this conversation is now turning weird. What? What is this man carrying on about? I think she's singing, so now he's going to give me water. What? She points out to him, you don't even have a bucket. Her confusion, I think, is understandable. Jacob's well was famous for its living water. It came from an underground spring, which meant that the water was moving, which was the definition of living water. No, 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 says Jesus. I mean a different kind of living water, one that will gush up to eternal life. And here's what I love about this moment. This woman now has a Nicodemus moment. Jesus has just said something that was clearly metaphorical. He had done the same thing with Nicodemus, you recall. You must be born again, he had said, born from above. Now, Nicodemus, he's a well-educated man, had to have known that Jesus didn't mean that literally. But he chose to take it that way. Easier tactic to take. He made a joke of it. He dismissed it with, you know, I'm old. I can't crawl back into my mother and be born again. What are you talking about? This woman, I know, does something way more complicated. She says two things. And I think the first thing she says indicates that she knows it's a metaphor of ultimate importance. So she says, give me this water so that I am never thirsty again. And then I think she's embarrassed. There is in that, please give me this water. There is so much longing, so much vulnerability. And I think she's afraid she's exposed herself too much. So maybe he didn't mean that is anything profound. So quickly she adds, I mean, I would like to never have to come back to this well again. But the first response, I think, was the real one. Surely he meant something more profound. It sounded like he did. And Jesus' response to that must have been very painful for her because it seems so off topic. Go, call your husband, and bring him back with you. And you hear a feeling, I thought we were talking about water, sir. And this is a point where she could have just walked away because he's asking her to be openly vulnerable to him in a way that I suspect she would prefer not to. He's a stranger for heaven's sakes. But she stands still. She tells the truth. I have no husband. Ah, Jesus says, I know. You've had five husbands, and the man you are living with now is not your husband. And the woman must have been absolutely stunned when he said that. Now, this is where I pause for a brief public service announcement. For centuries, and continuing into the present, Christian commentators have taken that sentence about the five husbands and decided that it means that this woman was immoral. Trust me, I read some contemporary sermons this week and immoral is the politest term they have used. Such commentators apparently cannot imagine the re reality of a woman's life in the first century. I think they just don't want to. Yes, she may have been married five times, but please, this isn't some wild woman dancing away in singles bars across Sychar. She had not divorced anybody because women couldn't even legally do that. Perhaps she had suffered from a husband who had abandoned her. Surely she had been widowed more than once. And if she was living with a man, not her husband, it most likely meant that she had been taken by, in by the younger brother of her last husband as the law required. She had a roof over her head, but she was reduced to the status of a servant and a concubine, not a wife. When Jesus says this to her, there's not a hint of reproach. There is no condemnation. I think he said this to her very softly. And what his words conveyed were, 
I see you. I see you. I know the ongoing disasters. I know the pain. I know the seemingly endless miseries that you have endured. What he offers here is compassion. He offers her love. We all know what happens in our heart when someone we are with acknowledges, acknowledges us, lets us know that they know who we are, clearly accept us exactly as we are. We are so drawn into that. You know that. And so it is with this woman. Very quietly, I think, she says, I see, sir, that you are a prophet. And I think this is the point where she sits down because she wants more of this conversation. And what ensues, amazingly enough, is a theological discussion. Should we worship in Jerusalem, she asked, or where we Samaritans have worshiped for centuries on Mount Gerizim? Well, Jesus says Jerusalem, but he quickly adds that it doesn't really matter because someday soon, the only thing that will matter is that we worship God in spirit and in truth, all of us together. This is when she knows who she's talking to. She can't make herself ask the question directly. So it comes out, I think, shyly, a little sideways. She's asking him to confirm something. She says, you know, sir, I believe in the Messiah, the one who will come to explain everything to us. And we must imagine the wild hope that pounded in her chest as she waited for the response. I am he. Yes, I am he. That's where the reading for today ends. It's, that's not the end of the story. <laughs> what happens next would make a funny movie, I think. I love to imagine the bewilderment on the disciples' faces as they come ambling back from town and they notice that their master is talking to a Samaritan woman, for heaven's sakes. And the Samaritan woman suddenly jumps up and leaves her water jar and goes running past them back to town calling out, I just met the man who knows everything. Come with me to the well. Come and see. Come and see. And the townspeople do. And when Jesus and the disciples leave two days later, they leave behind a great many followers, including, of course, the woman whose name we will never know. I have found reading John 3 and 4 together to be quite illuminating. The contrast in the two conversations that John reports is just so stark that you have to know that the gospel writer was clearly up to something here, something quite deliberate. Nicodemus, this wealthy man who, is, who has witnessed what Jesus has done, a man who says he knows that Jesus is from God, he comes to Jesus in the dark, and he stays in the dark. He just cannot let himself commit to what his heart knows. Not completely, he can. And in today's conversation, a woman who has never seen Jesus, never heard him preach, never seen him heal, commits herself completely to her encounter with him. In the bright noonday sun, she becomes not just a believer, but an evangelist. Dark and light, one of John's favorite themes, actually. And his meaning could not be clearer. The dark in Jerusalem, the light in a Samaritan village. There are no insiders. There are no outsiders in the world that Jesus imagines. There are only those who will stand in the light and commit to love and justice and compassion. And perhaps there's one more message from this story of the woman at the well. We all ask ourselves how it is that we can find God 
where we can find God. Sometimes we long for that desperately when we feel alone and isolated. The Samaritan woman seems to be telling us that if we approach each encounter of our lives with honesty, with openness, with a willingness to be vulnerable, if we lean in with a desire to truly know whom we are talking to, well, lo and behold, there's God. What good news that is. Amen.